So, go. So, part of what we are doing when we say we want to establish a platform for collaborating and researching and so on, it's not just a platform for discussion. It's not just a series of workshops or something like that. We also want to share methods. And part of that means methods that help us to connect with data sources, uh, be able to apply some of the modern methods like we have in uh, data science and artificial intelligence and so on. So the ability to create models quite easily. And uh, there are other methods that facilitate tracking of devices and managing the privacy correctly around that. Um, and also being able to deploy these solutions uh, in a cloud service and uh, granting other people access to the methods. So in terms of developing a platform, it's not merely a platform for discussion, it's also a platform for making available methods and uh, converting the, uh, the ideas into things that people can actually use. And uh, towards that also, being able to support uh, a kind of culture of innovation and development. And of course, uh, our two speakers, uh, Manjusha and Jonathan, uh, will help us understand how we can also get these concepts out there so that they are having the impact that we'd like to see our solutions having. So that's the concept for GeoStage. And in the discussion section, um, I, I want to say this is a live conversation. It's not as if GeoStage is an established thing already. Um, it's, uh, it's very much something where we are looking for impact uh, for, uh, how can I say, uh, we are looking for input to see how we can actually achieve some of the objectives outlined here. So uh, that's an important discussion that we'll have uh, at the end. And then towards that, what uh, we'll be doing is uh, working through some examples. So I'll be sharing some of my experiences as a kind of newcomer to the geo space and, uh, and then looking at uh, some of these. So we've talked about the program for today already. So going into one of the first projects, um, which was supported uh, by Smart Exchange. And um, so this is a project uh, involved in the emissions estimation uh, from vehicles. So it started out at looking at the logistics industry and determining whether we could track a vehicle and understand the driver's behavior because the driver's behavior is a significant contributor to the nature of the emissions uh, that are derived from vehicles activity. And uh, this image is showing uh, the system in action. So this is a, an actual Saturday morning drive that I took to test the system. So uh, I left my house and, and sorry, the density of points here makes, makes it a little bit difficult to see, but I took my vehicle, I, I drove it uh, on this loop and, uh, and I went back home. So uh, the high density of points uh, is kind of left here on this uh, picture. I did want to show the high density of points because we now have the ability to take that number of readings. We can sample at quite high rates today. And that's not because of some new uh, device or some kind of um, new external agency. It's because of uh, the, the new uh, APIs available, the new application programming interface available in a basic thing like HTML5. And I say that's a basic thing because that's something that your browser supports. And this was done on a cell phone. So this wasn't some telematics device taking these measurements. And uh, uh, our uh, original partner in this, uh, AK from uh, KDG Logistics will tell you that uh, on his fleet vehicles, uh, they actually had telematics devices installed and that's how we were first uh, taking readings of vehicles. But now this was done just on a cell phone. And so we can get high frequency, high quality readings today. And, uh, and so with these uh, high frequency readings, we are able to sample at such a high rate 
that we can infer driver behavior. So this is showing for that trip, the profile of speed. So it's showing all uh, the different speeds that were applied at different points in time. And then you can convert that into a histogram showing the distribution of, uh, of speed and speed changes and changes in direction. You can do the same for the acceleration here. So you can use all that to infer the fuel consumption rate and the, the safety of that driver, the, the safety profile uh, as, a, as a kind of way of characterizing that driver. And you can imagine there are many applications of that kind of analysis. So for example, um, there's emissions reduction. So we can look at um, if we are able to uh, estimate the fuel consumption, we can relate the amount of fuel consumed to the amount of emissions uh, put out there. And you can create some kind of influence in such a system. So if you show the drivers their fuel consumption and, and uh, that can influence a reduction, vehicles already have fuel consumption, but quite often that's averaged out over several other influences. And it's not really trying to influence your uh, behavior. But if you have access to such data, you can uh, devise incentivization uh, aspects to this to influence your emissions reduction. And uh, maybe AK, uh, you'd like to speak later about the ideas about uh, gamifying particular sub routes uh, in travel and so on. Um, so that's some of the work there. Um, you can, of course, imagine connecting the driver safety profile with the, with the insurance industry. And then, of course, there's uh, delivery tracking, but there are many systems out there that uh, are doing that. Uh, and uh, it just partly due to COVID, there are many, uh, th this has always been done, but now you have available a system that you can get into uh, for customizing that uh, to a particular application. So that was one of the first projects, the Eco Warrior. Uh, so that was largely looking at tracking uh, driver's behavior. The second project uh, concerned our interest in groundwater and identifying which sites uh, would likely give us uh, the best operational boreholes. And uh, in this case, what we'd like to do is create a machine learning model, which would estimate how likely we were to get a good borehole if we drilled at a particular site. So if we are interested in machine learning models, that poses a certain difficulty because work of this nature, um, when working with uh, geotype people, if I can uh, call them that, uh, geo people working with these GIS systems often think in these terms, right? So you have a map on which you are mapping some kind of characteristic so you select some property of interest. It could be population density uh, or, or uh, rainfall or things like that. And you get a two-dimensional representation of that and you are able to, uh, uh, to make certain decisions and so on. So that's uh, sort of the interface approach that uh, many people in that space are used to. And in contrast, people from the world of machine learning tend to think like this. Right, so looking at this first column, uh, quite often what we have is there's some output that we are trying to uh, determine. So for example, here, if you're trying to work out um, whether someone will like a certain font that you want to use, um, then your output is like, you want to, uh, to classify something as a likable font or not, and then you'll have certain features. So you, you might specify a style uh, and of course a font face and, uh, and then uh, a layout type and so on. So these are what a machine learning person would call a, uh, a set of features and that's a label. And uh, those of us from engineering might think of these as well. These are inputs and there's an output. And you see it's quite tabular. So once a machine learning person sees uh, a table like this where there's a label and some features, then they know exactly what to do. Whereas, uh, as we've said, uh, in the geo space, people quite often uh, have this kind of two-dimensional graphical view of things. So how do we connect these two worlds? 
Well, number one, there are many uh, application programming interfaces out there. Uh, that's the second time I've used that term. So uh, APIs are, um, are bits of code that you can use to get one computer system to talk to another. So for example, if you have a database um, of, uh, of names of people, of students, let's say, then you can query that database through an API. You can ask how many students have marks above this value and, and things like that. So an API, uh, one of the things you can do with it is, uh, is query data. And so um, there is an important data set, the, the Google Earth Engine. So that's, that helps you get characteristics, uh, geo characteristics at a geo location. So if you specify a latitude and a longitude, you can extract, for example, uh, the rainfall, uh, you can get the soil type, you can get uh, the vegetation level. So uh, many, many characteristics, many, many um, satellite images that can be analyzed to get all kinds of uh, characteristics. And you'd be amazed by the, the hundreds of, uh, of characteristics that you can get there. There are some other ones. There's the NASA uh, data set. There's, uh, there are also some quite specific ones. Uh, so Mapbox, for example, is quite good for looking at infrastructure and so on. So there are these fantastic APIs that you can use to collect data from. And that's going to give you the types of characteristics that we mentioned. And so that's how you can query um, an image like this. So if you have a set of points, so if you uh, select some specific points here, then you can extract values like that at those points and you can join them to a data set. So quite often when you collect data, it really looks like this. You can specify the location where you, um, you, you committed some measurement. And uh, so your measurement, perhaps it was that at this location, I don't have an active borehole. Uh, whereas here, I, I do have an active borehole. So then you can take these uh, coordinates and then you can query Earth Engine and you can get back uh, the geo characteristics in that region. So you can connect geo characteristics using coordinates and you connect your own data set also using the geo coordinates. And in that way, you've now connected geo characteristics to some kind of uh, measurement. And so that is a, a typical data set that a machine learning person is used to. So, in that form, you've got inputs or uh, features, and you've got outputs or labels. So that's pretty much ready for machine learning now. So that's um, uh, what Joash will show in, uh, in greater detail in, uh, in HydroBlue. And so we've, we are able now to take coordinates and get a geo characteristic. And then given a geo characteristic, if we can create a model that can, can say, given the rainfall and the vegetation level and so on, I can predict whether or not you will have a good borehole, um, then that is a model. So finding this function f is the task of the machine uh, modeler. So that is just one instance. You can imagine using such a framework for all kinds of other applications. So if you have some other concept in mind, if you would like to um, in, uh, estimate or, or create a model that estimates uh, some prediction, <clears throat> then you can use such a framework uh, to do that. So in project two, I would say, uh, we learned how to connect those two worlds, the machine learning and geo characteristics worlds. Um, a third project of interest is in relief operations. So of course, we've recently had the uh, major floods in Durban and uh, many people requiring extraction. Uh, so uh, just moving to a place of safety. Then of course, for a much longer time, many people with uh, challenges uh, in accessing water and other supplies. So being able to, uh, to declare that I need such support in my region. Um, so that's what this service was put out for. Uh, during the times of uh, rioting and looting as well, uh, there were uh, food security issues that came up. And of course, that led us to thinking about um, 
So how do you distribute this in the best possible way? Right, so quite often government will put out this pot of money and there are resources that need to be distributed properly. And so how do you keep track of uh, who has collected resources and where uh, resources are still needed? So uh, a service like a geolocation uh, type of framework uh, can support that. If uh, you've been following the uh, war in, in Ukraine, there have been reports of uh, using geo services uh, to report on troop movements and uh, to track uh, certain vehicles and so on. So uh, there are many, of course, military applications to geo services. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, some of the problems that have been uh, solved in, in this area, of course, in a system like this, uh, what can be done is um, you can maintain the confidentiality on uh, reporting of issues. And for example, people um, who need relief from disaster, uh, even when it's a public known event, uh, not everyone uh, uh, wants to disclose their, uh, that they need support. And so you can manage your level of disclosure in, in such digital systems. And we've already mentioned about uh, proper distribution of resources and inventory and, and things like that. Um, so that was another application that uh, related to geosensitive problems. <clears throat> uh, these slides just uh, point out some of the uh, work that we've done in developing uh, training materials. Uh, so in understanding machine learning and in applying machine learning well, uh, there are certain things that uh, one has to um, uh, contextualize quite well. So in machine learning, quite often it's about classifying something as uh, true or false or belonging or not belonging. So in a case like that, um, this concept of true positive and uh, true negative and false positive and false negative, um, those uh, are very important to apply correctly because there are certain problems where it's not necessary to have uh, good accuracy all the time. So if we think about the borehole problem, if we have misclassified a site as not being good for boreholes, when it can yield a good supply of water, then that's a missed opportunity. And then if we have classified something as being a good site, but it turns out that it's not a good site, then there are costs, uh, uh, there will be certain costs of drilling that site. And so you see there are different uh, economic outcomes uh, to misclassifying in a particular way. So having um, a certain sites being classified in, uh, in a specific way will lead to a different outcome. Uh, here's a different example. So we also use machine learning for education in estimating whether a student is at risk of failure. And the action that's taken is, uh, if you are estimated to be at risk of failure, then you uh, will be given more counseling support, more academic counseling to help you improve your results. Now, if you get it wrong and you say, I believe the student is at risk, when actually they weren't at risk, then all that's happened is you've given that student extra counseling. But if you misclassify in the opposite sense where a student was really at risk, but you didn't realize that and you didn't uh, spend the resources on extra counseling there, then, uh, and if that student fails, then there's a missed opportunity for improving uh, the, the performance of the student. So there are very different consequences to, uh, to getting it wrong in different ways. So that's why these problems in machine learning are, are a bit different to the types of problems in regression or continuous variable type problems. Um, then in terms of the GeoStage platform that we mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, ways to manage uh, sets of data and uh, being able to store them in online platforms. You can connect different uh, collections of data in different ways. Um, and you can build machine learning models on that same platform. Um, and then you can also build interfaces. So you'll see uh, uh, HydroBlue uh, demonstrated by Joash uh, in a bit. 
And uh, you can create other uh, services like that uh, using this kind of platform. So part of what we are trying to do is just release the tools and let people play and see uh, what's possible there. Um, and then as we say, uh, we are looking for your ideas for how we can collaborate as a platform uh, to, to create something that makes it much easier for us to translate concepts and ideas into things that, that can have impact. So thanks very much for listening. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Manjusha Sunil, uh, manager for the WEDA project with the, uh, with the Water Research Commission. So Manjusha, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Randir. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm just going to share my presentation quickly. Uh, Randir, if you can please let me know when you see it on your screen. I can see it in non-presentation mode. <laughs> okay. Let's get it onto presentation. Is it on presentation mode now? Great, yes, thanks Man Manjusha. Yeah, okay, great. So, so good afternoon once again, colleagues and Thank you to Prof. Rendir and team for the opportunity to speak at this event. As introduced, uh, my name is Manjusha Sunil. I'm from an organization called the Water Research Commission. And I'll be taking you through a brief presentation on the WRC and some of the work we do when it comes to accelerating R&D and innovations uh, in the water sector. So for those of you who don't know much about the WRC, the organization has been in existence for more than 50 years. In fact, we celebrated our 50 year anniversary last year. Uh, we have a vision for being able to support a highly informed water decision making sector through science and technology. We work across um, various levels and a range of uh, stakeholders from both the public sector, private sector and community partners to look at uh, innovative water solutions for research and development in South Africa, but also for the rest of the African continent and uh, globally. We have quite an in-depth mission which allows us to serve as a premier water hub and be a, uh, active across the innovation value chain and this uh, cuts across a number of areas, uh, such as policy and decision making, where a lot of our research supports these processes, creation of new products and services for socioeconomic development, human capital development, empowerment of communities, reduction in poverty, uh, sustainable solutions, and deepened water research and development in South Africa, and as I mentioned earlier, Africa and the um, developing world. In terms of how we've been established, we are established in terms of the Water Research Act of 1971. We are a Schedule 3A public entity and we are an entity of the Department of Water and Sanitation. So that is the ministry that we report to. The WRC has five primary functions that serve multiple stakeholders in various ways. And core to what we do is to establish a water research needs and priorities, uh, look at promoting coordination, cooperation and communication in the areas of water research, stimulate and fund water research according to priorities. And these priorities I have to mention are generated from numerous engagements with various stakeholders within the water sector, as well as uh, within the national system of innovation. And then key to what we are doing uh, is also to uh, promote the effective transfer of innovation and technology, information and technology rather, and also look at enhancing knowledge and capacity building within the water sector. So fundamental guiding framework for the WRC's operations is what we call the WRC knowledge tree, which is essentially um, six strategic objectives and the knowledge tree is uh, a yardstick basically to measure the WRC's impact in, in addressing this um, six uh, strategic objectives. Over the past seven years or so, uh, the, the organization reoriented its model to move from just purely investing into R&D 
uh, to R&D for impact and therefore funding across the entire value chain. Now at the WRC, uh, there are four key branches, but the technical branches are two, which is the research and development unit branch and the innovation and impact branch. So in the research and development branch, uh, there are opportunities to offer new knowledge in water and sanitation through research and development projects. And the research or the knowledge generated from this research then ultimately uh, results in your refined technologies and innovations which the WRC provides to the water sector to address specific needs and challenges. So in the R&D branch, there are three key strategic areas that look at water resources and ecosystems, water use and waste ma management, and water utilization and agriculture. Selection of the projects for funding is done through a call process. Different, there are different types of calls. It can be directed calls, which looks at very specific needs, open calls that invite uh, submissions on, on topics that might be beneficial for the water sector and short-term projects which, which look at responding to urgent needs. But on average, the, the projects that are funded by the R&D branch uh, run between two to uh, five years. Um, so each of these key strategic areas that we have in the R&D branch uh, provide an integrated framework for investment in addressing a portfolio of what we call key water related needs. Now, moving on to the innovation and impact branch, uh, the, I think we're all aware of the complexity of the water challenges that we face in the country, which means that the water sector needs game changes urgently and the development and adoption of new innovative technologies and new products and services um, leading to the creation of new industries actually would form part of the solutions that are needed uh, to address the country's growing water challenges. And through the innovation and impact branch and the business development and innovation unit, where I'm based, we focus on looking at uh, creating a robust and vibrant innovation ecosystem that would allow the organization to play a leading and coordinating role with strategic partners to try and take accel uh, accelerate technologies uh, to the market. And within that business development and innovations team where I'm based, we have two technology accelerators. One is WADER, which is a water technologies demonstration program that I'm responsible for. And the other is the SASTA program, which is the South African uh, Sanitation Technology Enterprise pr uh, Program. Just very briefly on these two tech accelerators, SASTA, which is the Sanitation Tech Enterprise Program, is actually a joint initiative between the Department of Science and Innovation and the Bill and Galinda Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation with WRC as a technical partner. And this program is actually the culmination of years of investment and research uh, into sanitation. Um, and the program was started based on uh, consensus amongst the WRC stakeholders and sector partners that there is actually need uh, when it comes to uh, creating a new sanitation reality in South Africa, particularly with regards to the provision of adequate, safe, dignified, and affordable uh, sanitation. Uh, through the SASTA platform, there are opportunities provided to empower sanitation entrepreneurs and industrialists who can drive local manufacturing and uh, look at long-term industrialization of innovative uh, sanitation solutions. The WADER platform, which is the logo that you see on your right, was launched uh, uh, over seven years ago, again as a partnership between the Department of Science and Innovation and the WRC, and also after an extensive consultation process with a wide range of stakeholders where the need for such a platform was identified. So essentially, WADER is an innovation intermediary that enables the fast tracking of tech deployment. And this is done through robust piloting, testing, scale up, independent technical assessments, which ensure that there's provision of credible information to the water sector, and also knowledge brokering and stakeholder or partner engagements uh, become very important to look at leveraging further opportunities to ensure that um, 
the solutions that we support actually do get to market. In the SASTA program, there's a range of off-grid technologies that are being scaled up and the um, SASTA innovation toolbox consists of innovations with a particular focus on the circular economy. In the interest of time, I won't go into the details of the technologies, but should you be interested to know more, I've shared the SASTA website link on the slide and uh, you can take a look at what is being done through um, the uh, sanitation program. So what are some of the opportunities offered through the Wader Tech Accelerator? Well, firstly, we provide uh, funding for piloting um, as well as prototype development improvements, et cetera, when we identify innovative solutions that we think might be of benefit to the water sector. Um, we um, uh, uh, have independent assessment processes, which ensure that we provide credible technical information uh, to the water sector on all the pilots or projects that we've supported. Uh, we provide access to information on a range of technologies that we've tested. Uh, we also provide technical advice for walk-in innovators and entrepreneurs wishing to introduce their solutions to the water sector. Uh, I mentioned that we have a key role when it comes to knowledge brokerage. So we connect and create opportunities to connect our innovators with other entrepreneurs, test bed partners. We match make with municipalities and other role players in our national system of innovation, uh, ultimately hoping that the work that we do will lead to the growth of SMMEs and, enter and enterprise, enterprise development in the country. So uh, this in infographic is essentially a summary of the growth of the WADA platform since its inception. Seven years ago, we started with just two pilot projects, which then moved to nine. And currently in the WADA Innovation Toolbox, we have about 46 different technologies that we have uh, supported, ranging from a technology readiness level of five to eight. There's about 44 million rands that have, has been invested into these projects. And we've worked with uh, about 37 SMMEs and nine higher education institutions. Um, this slide is just uh, showing you a few examples of some of the innovations we have pilot piloted. It's definitely not the full list, but uh, the innovations that we have supported have ranged from rainwater harvesting systems to water leak detection technologies, toilet systems that flush using a third of the normal flush volume, water storage tanks for whole households, remote technician and virtual training tools, and of course, uh, solutions like the HydroBlue uh, software, which I will speak about in the next uh, two slides or so. I did mention the importance of partnerships when it comes to the tech accelerators, and this this is crucial for a number of reasons, you know, either related to test sites where we can actually do the field testing, opportunities for further funding, for upscale and improvements based on the initial pilots or prototypes, manufacturing opportunities, et cetera. So we've worked with a number of municipalities across the countries, uh, across the country rather as test but partners to pilot some of the innovations that we've selected under the WADA platform. We currently have a network of 34 test sites across the country. We've also engaged with a range of partners, not just locally, but also internationally. We've worked with partners like the UNDP to jointly scan for innovative solutions. And it's through the UNDP partnership and the scanning process that we were actually introduced to the Hydro Blue solution. And then sub the, the project was subsequently supported uh, for you know, initial development and further development. So let me just um, spend a, just a few minutes on, on the Hydro Blue solution. I don't want to steal the thunder from Joe Ash, and I know Prof has mentioned a little bit about it, but this is essentially a predictive software system that enables hydrogeologists to make data-driven decisions when identifying suitable locations to drill sustainable boreholes. So in the first phase, which was a phase supported by the UNDP, the system was upgraded uh, to predict the probability of groundwater at almost any geolocation on a global scale. 
And then based on the independent assessment process that we did at the end of the project uh, with UNDP, there was a lot of interest and, uh, uh, in the solution. And I think the value of the solution was so evident that uh, there was a recommendation to support a second phase and look at system upgrades for model accuracy and look at extensions related to water quality yield estimations, drill depths, et cetera. Hence, the second phase of this project was supported by the WADA platform. And this has been successfully completed with an accuracy of close to 90%. So um, I think the economic and some of the other values of such a tool would, would be a, a few. Uh, as highlighted on the on the on the on the slide, uh, the drill depth extension uh, function was essentially uh, could serve as a feasibility study as all projects are charged per meter drilled in the in in SADAC, you know, and I think reduced drill depths would enable water organizations to further distribute the investment, increase their reach. Um, the yield model that was developed to provide some opportunities for hydrogeologists to better understand the service potential of a borehole drilled and proactively plan to avoid overexploitation of the groundwater. And I think we are aware that overexploitation of groundwater as a resource can result in numerous challenges. And then with the groundwater contaminant extensions, uh, which were developed to predict geolocations with excessive amounts of common contaminants in the groundwater. This feature would enable, you know, government and other organizations to identify regions uh, with groundwater that is unfeasible to treat, but also uh, create new economic and environmental opportunities for industries that require a specific contaminant as a feed resource, maybe in their production lines. And so what is the value proposition for, of, of such a tool? I think we're all aware that South Africa is a, is a water scarce country and uh, the demand actually um, exceeds the supply that we have. There is increase in uh, socioeconomic pressures on urban water supplies and resources. Our metropolitan municipalities rely primarily on surface water supply and therefore, um, Groundwater is becoming increasingly considered as an alternative resource for urban settlements. And I think the strategic importance of groundwater, groundwater for both uh, water and food security is likely to intensify under climate change as there are more frequent and intense uh, climate extremes. And therefore, you know, I think uh, I cannot highlight enough the the, the benefits of such a solution. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I've just shared my email address. Uh, should anyone wish to get in touch with me, also, I've also shared the link to the WADA website. And from the WADA website, you should be able to also get to the Water Research Commission's website um, should you wish to know more about the platforms and the organization. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Manjusha. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, that's some excellent work uh, going on at the WRC. Um, you've mentioned to me uh, before you have to leave for another meeting, but I'll be sure to relay any questions that, uh, that arise there. And uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to really thank you for your support of the Hydro Blue project. And I'll say, you know, besides the grant and, and the many uh, opportunities for exposure, it's also been those regular reporting back sessions and the discussions mm -hmm. that have led the system to where it is now. Um, so I, I really thank you for that. Um, thank you so much, Rendir. And uh, I don't mean to be rude, but I did mention to Rendir that I'm dealing with another urgent crisis at the, at the, at the organization and I have to be in another meeting. So I will be excusing myself shortly. But Rendir, I look forward to us connecting post this meeting and also, you know, um, engaging further. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Manjusha. Then I'm sharing the program again. And also I'd like to introduce and welcome to the, the geo stage now, uh, Mr. Jonathan Naidu, the CEO of Smart Exchange. And of course, uh, Jonathan, 
uh, Smart Exchange has uh, been also a strong supporter of the Hydro Blue project. And also in our uh, regular feedback sessions with you, um, we are able to progress the system. It's, uh, it's some very good critical feedback that you've been giving us. So it's, uh, it's an honor for me to welcome you to the stage. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, and thank you for those uh, warm words of welcome. Uh, good afternoon to all the delegates that's uh, on the session. And uh, Prof, um, uh, my interpretation of the session, uh, tongue in cheek, is uh, this is your payback time for Smart Exchange to say, hey, come on, Smart Exchange. I'm giving you a platform to market what you guys do, right? I said it tongue in cheek because I know that's certainly not your objective. I must compliment you, Prof, on the, this great initiative uh, in terms of asking for collaboration for this platform where both research and sharing of methodologies can be mutually beneficial to people on the platform. Um, it's a great initiative. And to Dr. Sunil, um, thank you for enlightening us about the good work that your Water Research Commission is doing. And uh, I'm super excited because I'm convinced it's going to add tremendous value to the Hydro Blue project as well. Uh, I think it's important that I first say a few words about Smart Exchange. It's an organization that pays my salary, and it's an organization <laughs> Uh, that helps many innovators at the same time. Uh, now, Smart Exchange has uh, commenced its business operations since 2004. Uh, the initial uh, objective was exclusively focusing on ICT, uh, looking at establishing startup companies in that specific sector. And then as years went on, we migrated uh, from ICT, we included media there because we've seen the impact of digital uh, um, technologies on media. Hence, we became the MICT incubator, and then electronics came in wanting new programs, and software developers were busy with programming electronic gadgets. So we became the MICTE sector to embrace electronics. And of course, more recently, with the move of education from STEM to STEAM, we thought it prudent to include the arts within the originally designated ICT sector. So our new acronym is now MICT Incubator. Now, why it's important to tell the story is to show that we just want to embrace changes that happens within the, the environment. And by embracing the changes as an organization, we become much more relevant to the different stakeholders. So what do we do? I did say we focus on startups. Uh, we try and make them uh, be good commercial companies. And we're proud to uh, talk about our highlight, the greatest highlight that any incubator could achieve was to have a company listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in the form of Adapt IT. We listed that company and we're proud of that. And we're equally proud our second company uh, called IT Master is now going for listing on the Alt Exchange. So I think that's a super cool story emanating from one incubator. Of course, all these things happen because of a number of factors. The first one being we've got an astute board who keeps us on track, giving us good strategic guidance. So we recognize that. We've got two powerful patrons in the form of J.B. Magwaza and Exonia Nyosulu. They are very influential in opening corporate doors. And then, of course, our big sales pitch is our unqualified audits since inception of 2004. Our last unqualified audit was given to us two weeks ago and it was confirmed at our AGM. Now, Smart Exchange didn't keep its, uh, its know-how just to the Durban environment. We began a replication model based on the different economies. So the first one in Durban was based on the metro economy. The second one in Kwamashu was based on the township economy. 
The third one in Port Chepstone was based on a small town economy. The fourth one that we're currently working on right now is the one in a rural community called Coxted. And of course, our fifth one, which we kind of jumped the gun with Prof, uh, was to look at commercialization of research uh, material. Uh, we think there's a lot of powerful research sitting within the CSIR and universities that need a commercialization push. So that's our fifth stage of replication. Now, we're super excited in terms of uh, working with innovators. Um, now, the specific case in point with, with Prof was his two projects. Uh, one is um, on the reduction of the emissions and looking at driver behavior, the Eco Warrior project. It was quite a cool project, and um, I'm convinced it can still make a very big commercial impact, uh, given the right kind of drivers in terms of taking that pro project forward. Um, again, it ties off with the geolocation platform that we're talking about. Uh, we've done other geolocation projects that can be integrated onto this platform, linked predominantly on the he health system, more on rural health projects, looking at uh, rural pregnancy issues and all of those nice things out there. But more specifically uh, for the push of today's agenda, I see it kind of slanting towards Hydro Blue. And now Hydro Blue, uh, excuse the pun, is another cool project. And um, the, the kind of history books tell us that the next wars would be fought over water. Of course, I must put a disclaimer, the exception being we don't know Putin may react and it may not necessarily be the next war fought over water. It could be fought for many other reasons. But the point is, Prof, your project is so relevant uh, to the issue, uh, more specifically in South Africa, because of water being a scarce uh, resource or commodity. Now, it ties in very well with the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well. But the only disappointing point is that government departments don't get super excited about these things. You know, unless you get a politician uh, who becomes the right jockey to take the project forward. Now, that's the disappointing part. In all of the good work that we do, we can clearly see on the horizon where the project can lead to. But the political take-up is so slow. A case in point, Prof, uh, we met with Copta, we introduced them to the project in KZN. They were super excited. Your cool generosity of saying, guys, in KZN, you can have this project for Mahala because we want to give back. And still, the report back I get is that, hey, the kind of information that they promised us is slow to come. But when there's a public in Bezo, uh, to shout with the halos and the PA system that this is what we're doing. That's the only time they jump for these things. And when the event is over, it's kind of put onto the back burner. And we need to be more vocal about these things because they need to be behaving as public servants. They are our servants. That's why they chose to take on a public office. And when they see something good like this emanating more from research and the universities, et cetera, they need to put their hands up and say, we want to certainly endorse projects of this nature. But Prof, in conclusion, I would like to say from Smart Exchange side, it was an absolute pleasure to work with you and your team. Uh, Joash in particular was the driver of this project. Um, you guys were so good on compliance. We were so good on kind of uh, record keeping and, and giving us the information that we really wanted. And I would never hesitate to give you a letter of recommendation to anybody, whether it is the Water Research Commission, et cetera, to say, this is a company that stops on compliance besides being great on the innovations that they are presenting. So Prof, um, my closing remark now is, uh, may I wish you and your team all the best with Hydro Blue, an eco warrior in terms of its next level of commercialization. But more importantly, may this platform that you're advocating and pushing forward be a platform 
that we all need to subscribe to and ensure that we promote this thing onto our uh, social media chats, et cetera. So congratulations and well done, Prof. Thank you very much as well for having me on as a panelist. Um, I feel proud to be associated uh, as a member of this panel promoting this great initiative. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, that, that, those were some really kind remarks and also some, some great insights there. And I must say, it, it's not just out of gratitude that we asked you to speak, that comment you made right at the beginning. You know, I, I knew you would add in there some, some specific, uh, you know, you, you would uh, get us out of that politeness zone and, and help us to, to talk about some of the real problems that we are facing in having the impact that we want to have. So, I mean, that comment about having the, the, the leadership come to the table. So having uh, the, the departments of water and sanitation, having government in on the conversation, I think that that is a very relevant uh, comment. And it, in fact, in the discussion section, I think that should be an important thing to consider. Um, so uh, we look forward to having that discussion further. And again, I'd like to really thank Smart Exchange for its excellent support. It, it's not just about a grant or, or something like that. It's also those conversations that we have with you at the end of each milestone that really has helped us find our feet and our direction through this really complex labyrinth. Sometimes it, it feels like uh, in terms of uh, finding our way between research and innovation. Thanks so much. Okay, then um, I guess, uh, Joash, um, we've been doing this kind of uh, uh, slow burn and of, uh, of building the anticipation to your presentation now. So, um, and maybe uh, just to add a bit to that, um, I'll say that, you know, as much as we are uh, putting forward GeoStage as a kind of the, the general platform, it's not the case that GeoStage, though, or even the idea for GeoStage was, was an established thing. It really happened uh, partly as the discussions for HydroBlue grew and we started to evolve the methods. And it's also Josh's uh, strong background in town, planning, in town planning and really the experience in working with these GIS systems that has led us to the kinds of con conversations that we are having today. So Josh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Prof, uh, for that introduction. And okay. So yeah, thank you once again, Prof, for that introduction and uh, everyone that's here today to actually attend this uh, presentation and the, uh, for the other speakers as well. So, I'm Joash, like Prof mentioned, I do have a background in town planning and in uh, GIS. And the product was established by us to address the water access crisis that we saw in South Africa. So on the screen on the right as well, you'll see that's all of the organizations that have supported the Hydro Blue project over time. And uh, we really are grateful to each and every one of them. So as I mentioned, we, we established Hydro Blue in South Africa because of the lack of uh, sanitary water to, be, to those living in the country, especially in the crisis being heightened in the rural areas. So as you can see, about eight out of 10 people in those areas do not have access to sanitary water. Then there was also the complex issue of problematic water samples being collected uh, in the country. Then there was the low quality, uh, sorry, the low success rate of borehole projects in the region. And while boreholes are a feasible solution in these uh, rural areas and remote regions, uh, the majority of these projects actually fail over time. And this was seen when we collected data to actually establish Hydro Blue, where it showed that only 26% of these borehole projects actually remained, uh, remained active. Uh, what, after a couple of years. And this resulted in an estimated loss of about 2.6 billion. And more importantly to us, um, it actually left so many people without sanitary water. 
so we then decided to let's try and apply these GIS and machine learning and AI techniques to try and improve the statistic and improve the standard of living of many who are in this country. So how we actually developed the how we actually developed the product was we collected spatial data sets that contain geolocations where boreholes were drilled. It, uh, we also collected data that uh, captured the yield measurement of boreholes, uh, the drill depth of boreholes. There were also some where it showed contaminants of the in the groundwater themselves. And um, what, what we actually then did was we spatially joined this borehole data that was captured locally to environmental data sets that were available through global satellite imagery. We pre-processed the data sets, and I think Prof explained it really well in the beginning, and I will explain it a bit better later on. And so we pre-processed it to get it to a point where machine learning could then be applied to kind of mathematically understand what environmental and geological measurements generally led to sustainable borehole sites. And some of the algorithms that we used are displayed on the slide. You can see it was things like the K nearest neighbors, the SVD uh, classification and degression trees and so on. So the way we see it is that this approach will enable hydrogeologists to make data-driven decisions on whether to drill or not before any equipment is actually deployed to site. And that's one of the big advantages of this uh, project is that a hydrogeologist can then receive the environmental and geological measurements of auto location remotely. And there's also the machine learning and AI that exposes the probability. So to use the system, uh, end users are just simply required to pan to the area of interest and then click evaluate. So as you can see, you have your exact latitude and longitude. So that's your, your coordinates. Once you, click, once you go to the, your area of interest and click evaluate, this will then return the probability of success. And once you click on this, it would expose the, all the conditions that we used to make that prediction. So the method also has a significant economic benefits to government organizations, NPOs, water parastatals, and basically anyone who's wanting to drill a borehole. So the Department of Water and Sanitation estimates that between 80,000 to 100,000 boreholes are drilled each year. But when we were doing our feasibility study to remain conservative, we used 35,000 uh, boreholes drilled. And, um, and, at this, at, and, sorry, and at an accuracy rate of 25%, this resulted in a loss in investment of 2.6 uh, billion rand. So we believe that by applying geospatial methods, we could improve this accuracy to between at least 70 to 80%, which will then result, which will then, sorry, reduce the loss in investment by 1.57 billion. It should also be noted that uh, we are planning to implement the project uh, on the pay as you use basis. And therefore, uh, clients will be likely to pay for 10% only if the project is successful. I think that shows um, it, it will help us get the project out there and it also shows our confidence in the actual product. So, so far, we, as I mentioned, we collected, um, we collected borehole data from local organizations and you can see most of them are on the displayed in the points on the screen. So that was from the Borehole Association, uh, the WRC, our local municipalities, water and sanitation. And then what we did was we merged that data with the uh, data collected from uh, the Google Earth Engine. There was also the NASA uh, Earth Data Portal. And through those API connections, we managed to actually access global environmental and geological databases. So this is some of the key data sources that were acquired when we were building the model. And um, you can see them on the left there. So this includes things such as rainfall, your vegetation cover or vegetation index, your land surface temperature, soil types. Altogether, there's about uh, 15 different features that we used. And we do believe that these 15 features at this stage acts as a proxy to things like the aquifers. However, we are in the process of collecting more uh, aquifer data and including it as part of the model building. We are also looking for any additional features that may correlate well with uh, successful borehole sites. And I think 
this is a ongoing process to keep looking what other available data is out there and how can it improve the model. So that's something we do keep high on our radar. Okay, so just to go a bit more specifically into the actual method. So once we collected the data sets and pre-processed them, they were spatially joined using geospatial methods in Python. Now in the field of GIS, the method that we used is more commonly known as an overlay intersect method. And how this works is illustrated in this figure on the slide. So you can think that the blue rectangle uh, represented the uh, so it represented the actual environmental data sets while the yellow um, red circle, sorry, represented the actual borehole points. So there, then we had this as the output feature. So we said, wait, show us the measurements within here. And what we actually did was, so we averaged out over time, what were things like your average rainfall, uh, what, were you, what were the average rainfall at that geolocation, the vegetation cover, and so on. So you could think as the borehole data was used as primary data sets, while the environmental data was the secondary data sets that it was joined to. So this resulted in a spatially joined data set, as you can see here, where you had, for example, inactive uh, borehole sites were represented as zero and active borehole sites as one. And then you would see all of the different uh, environmental uh, or geological measurements going across that row. So this actually represents one geolocation. You can think of it as one point on this map. So the map actually just shows the spatial distribution of the uh, different borehole points. So once we had spatially joined the data, um, it was pre-processed, as I mentioned, to a numerical format, and the machine learning classification algorithms were applied to mathematically understand the data and what generally led to successful outcomes. In total, we used six alg algorithms and boosted them based on their accuracy. So algorithms that performed better in the model actually ended up with a higher vote at the end. And this just, just make sure that you don't, that you capture, it, it just is a better method uh, for actually creating a probability for the, uh, when you actually query the model. Okay, so there's, so the different measurements of success of a model, uh, we can briefly explain here. So in total, there are four units of uh, measurement that are used in a confusion matrix. And this image on the right is how a confusion matrix typically works. So, so when we were training the model, what we did was we actually retain a portion of the data collected, which was about 20% for uh, testing the model that was developed. Then the newly trained model would be used to predict uh, the outcomes of this unseen data. So the confusion matrix, firstly, it exposes the accuracy of the prediction. So for example, it shows the number of predictions that were true and were correctly classified as true. So that would be true positives. Um, then it also showed the classifications that were false and correctly classified as false. And these classifications, for example, were they were they were false, but they were classified as true, and these were true, which were classified as false. And uh, so within that, you also have something else called your uh, your overall accuracy of the model, your precision score, your recall score, and your F1 scores. So the to us, the recall score was the most fundamental indicator, and that was the ability of the model to predict this true positive outcome because the overall objective of the study was not just to have an accurate model, but to have a model that can show you where you should drill. So we wanted to know where there were positive outcomes for sustainable boreholes and the model predict predicted this correctly. So the table below, uh, it illustrates the recall score of each model. And as I mentioned, the recall was the primary indicator. So we do anticipate that uh, the, the active and inactive model develop and the yield model accuracy will increase as more data becomes uh, available. So this is, we, we make this comment because it is something that we experienced when training the other models. And you can see that with the other models where we had a substantial amount of data and a good split between what was positive class, classification and what was negative, the accuracy rates are above 80%. 
Uh, with regards to the yield model, uh, the data set collected was primarily for irrigation and we used it to build the model. But we have recently collected a local data set from the Department of Water and Sanitation that holds better yield measurements for human consumption. So we're quite excited about this and integrating this into the model. Then the drill depth of the model, uh, the drill depth model was also used by, was also developed using data from different parts of the globe. So that's from the US, UK, Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. This was actually done um, to further generalize the model and to, for the model to learn better uh, an actual pattern of what leads to a good site. And you can actually see this illustrated by its recall score, where it has the highest uh, recall score amongst all of them. So therefore, we do believe that as we do get our hands on more data, the accuracies uh, will increase and eventually we will have a good generalized model. So this is just some of the existing methods that are currently used. So the overall success for each method was difficult to obtain. So we reviewed them in isolated cases where the model was applied. But it should be noted that these success rates are based on individual cases that were reported. And there also is a bias as the success is measured in instances where the environmental geological conditions were ideal for that type of method. I just also want to say that overall, though, we do know that the accuracy is about 26% in the country because that's what was reflected um, in the actual data set collected. And uh, the hydroblow model, it is the only model that the way we design it that will work across uh, various environmental conditions. It is also the first to allow hydrogeologists to survey a land without deploying any equipment to the site. Uh, early testing of the product for all the models have at least doubled the national average in South Africa based on its accuracy. And to create kind of an ethos of continuous development, uh, we, are, we are constantly looking for new geo characteristics that uh, hydrogeologists will use or that can be used in the model to improve the accuracy. Uh, additional borehole data from new regions are also constantly being sourced to improve the overall accuracy of the model. So I just want to thank you all for your time and attention during this presentation and I'd like to hand back to Prof at this time. Thanks very much Josh, uh, that's great. Um, so uh, there is a discussion session so uh, please hold your questions till then, uh, especially that um, we'd now like to welcome to the geo stage uh, Yotel Burns who founded Ecocentric, and uh, uh, this uh, invitation came from a conversation we had recently on uh, green buildings, uh, Yota. And um, in in fact, I, I just mentioned in passing about the Hydro Blue project, and then that led to a short discussion on uh, that that we also have to consider uh, other sustainability issues around that. And I thought it was a great opportunity for us to hear from both sides of it, because quite often we can uh, become excited by the technology solution out there. And, uh, and then as part of that, we also have to think about the long-term consequences uh, of uh, that application. Um, so without further ado, please go ahead, Yota. Super, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak here. I've been listening very intently to to the research and uh, the work has been ongoing and um, in, part of me is very excited another part of me is extremely worried about what's going on so i'm going to uh, maybe just as a quick introduction i know thank you very much prof for doing that already but just to give you some background um, i run a green building consultancy in johannesburg we've been uh, doing this since 2007 we work with uh, green building rating systems like green star um, which is uh, comes from our um, own local green building council uh, we have done um, a lot of uh, LEED buildings, which is uh, the rating system that comes from the United States. Um, and, uh, and we take a slightly different view from a, um, from a green building perspective and from a resilience perspective on groundwater. So I'm going to, uh, I have, actually, I actually did manage to quickly prepare a presentation. I have made notes, um, scribbled notes, and I'm going to put it in. I'm going to share now. I'm also going to switch up my video. 
Um, let me share my screen. So um, I will see my screen um, now. Just share my screen. Sure, we can see it. Thanks, Yota. Good. That's cool. Okay, let me then uh, uh, get cracked. What's the really what I want to talk about very quickly is really the um, the perspective from from the green building, um, and res, uh, from a, from a green building perspective and a resilience perspective. And I tell you why I'm talking about this. Um, the just, sure. okay. So what we're going to I'm going to be as yeah as I said I'm going to be talking about green buildings and resilience. Um, Importantly, let's have a look what our context is um, in, within uh, for nets, and, and we really want to. I really want to talk about net zero water in that kind of context. We're not just uh, be, as you know, not just from overall from a from a climate change perspective, from a perspective, we're not just looking at zero carbon um, within the built environment. We're also looking now increasingly at net zero water um, and uh, working with. Uh, the um, green building rating systems and other systems to achieve net zero water in, in, um, in the built environment in particular. And the built environment is wide in our definition. It, it's not just, not only commercial, of course, um, it's, uh, it, we, 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 we work in industrial, we work in um, now increasingly also in residential. So I just want to show you quickly and, and talk very briefly about what those green building rating tools are that are relevant in our context and our context, by our context, I mean a continental context. So we, I really, I'm not just talking about South Africa, but I'm talking um, our African continent. So we have um, the Green Star um, rating tool, Green Star SA, which is the green building rating tool that's developed by the Green Building Council of South Africa. And they have also issued a net zero guidance. So we have a net zero certification scheme, uh, which speaks to net zero carbon, net zero water, um, net zero waste, and net zero ecology. And um, I I'm going to be highlighting some of those elements just now. Then we have LEED, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental, which is the um, green building rating system apparently it comes from the United States. Um, and we've, uh, I think by now, we probably have about I would guess about 20 lead buildings and lead buildings and interiors and existing buildings in South Africa. We've done in our firm, we've probably done the lion's share of those. Um, there are about 500 Green Star um, certified projects. I just want to give in, in South Africa and with more on the continent. That's really important to consider as we kind of, um, as, as discussions evolve. Then we have EDGE, which is a green building rating tool um, developed by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, uh, which is administered here in South Africa by the Green Building Council, um, and which looks at um, has, has three major components within the system. One is energy, then we have materials, where we in particular look at embodied carbon in materials, and then water. And all, all those tools are increasingly now are looking at um, um, net zero, net, and in particular net zero, of course, net zero water. And then we're looking at uh, then another um, uh, rating tool, which is a little bit more esoteric, but it's um, gaining traction from a, well, conceptually, which is a living building challenge, is also a, a, um, a green building rating tool that comes out of the United States. Um, and they have a number of petals within, with, I just, they call it the water petal, this is a category within and I just put in what uh, the tar what the purpose is of this of the water petal is to realign how people value water, to address the energy and chemicals involved in transporting, purifying, and pumping water, and to redefine wastewater as a precious nutrient and resource. So having said this now, sort of this is where this from a, these are, are the green building tools that we use and which drive um, uh, companies. Uh, which drive you know property developers, which drive um, homeowners. Um, we we are looking, you know, which really drive the uh, developments in the built environment and also in within existing, uh, already existing uh, buildings. So just that context. Um, now, when we let me just get oh, sorry, let's get to this next. One. Okay, let's have a quick look at what the definition is for net zero water. Um, that comes from the Green Building Council. It, um, in, 
it, a net zero water building is a building that is designed, constructed and operated to greatly reduce total water consumption and then use harvested, recycled and reused water such that the amounts of water consumed is the same as the amounts of water that is produced, which is then net zero, or if the water recycled produced is greater than the water consumed. And then we, we talk about net positive. The overall goal here is to reduce the amount of potable water that is used. And I think this is really where the crux comes in for us. And, and that's, I'm going to hide, show this. What are you know the views on groundwater? Groundwater, and this is where I think this is now where the discussion probably has to go. Um, within Green Star, in LEED, and in EDGE, which are really the our predominant green building rating systems. Groundwater is a considered potable water, in which case it's and is an ineligible water source, source when we look at the reduction of potable water. So which becomes a really, in, in our um, green building rating systems and the momentum is there, it's um, the, the, even though it's voluntary, but it's driving, it's beginning to drive policy. Um, it's beginning to, you know, we've been in this, uh, you know, Green Building Council, the very first um, rating tool was developed in 2008 and has gained enormous traction um, in the property sector. And the fact that we cannot use groundwater um, and 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 uses as and claim as as non potable water because potable water has prevent is preventing quite a few um, buildings to, to to start looking at ground at, at at groundwater as a as a resource within buildings. Um, there are exceptions, and we've used those successfully when there is, for instance, subsoil drainage water, and when we have to dewater basements. Um, there's a case in point, you know, just as a, as an example for Hotel Verdi. In um, which is a, probably the greenest hotel on the continent, which is located uh, next to the um, uh, Cape Town International Airport. Um, we're using, um, and I, I was the green building consultant on that project um, a few years ago, um, and we're using the subsoil drainage water within the building. Um, that's uh, because otherwise, you know, as my colleague said, we would have to take a Get, take a boat to get to your car because of the, the of, of its location. Um, there's a lot of ground, um, subsoil drainage that we have to manage in that building, but we cannot uh, sink boreholes and then claim them as a sustainable water source, which is really a, is a very important consideration. The next consideration, and this is now comes, that's another slightly different view on groundwater, and I think that's something that's probably um, I, I would really like to hear your views on this as well. Um, within a living building challenge, and it's quite a bit of text here, but I put this up so we can quick, I can quickly read this to you. So within a living building challenge, we the same the the idea there is to really try and be off the kind of the municipal water grid, where of course groundwater abstraction really comes in. So they're taking a slightly different view on this. They're not prohibiting the use of groundwater, but they're looking at closed loop systems um, and which have to sit within the carrying capacity of the site's natural water system. So we're we'll really looking at, um, um, you know, at water, you know, sitting within a watershed or sitting within a, you know, in a water abstraction area. Um, so where the idea is that um, all water used by the project comes from and, and that's important, and is returned to the project site. So um, where the supply is groundwater, the project team must show that the aquifer is being recharged with the same amount of that is withdrawn on an annual basis, and that the withdrawing water, uh, that withdrawing the water for the project does not produce any negative or irreversible consequences, for instance, saltwater intrusion, draining of fossil water, et cetera. When then the water is returned to the aquifer after use, it must be reintroduced so that it does not compromise natural systems. So it must be treated and reintroduced at even at an appropriate temperature to avoid thermal pollution, etc. So that's really that's a slightly different view, but saying we really need to sit within this kind of closed loop system, and then we can um, rather um, where you know and of, of course reintroducing, resupplying um, water that is being abstracted from the site back into the um, into the project site. So that's really that's really critical to to consider. This is not a rating tool that's um, heavily used, but we use a lot of the principles increasingly now for uh, for the work that that that, that we're doing on, on water with our clients. Um, and then I just quickly want to highlight what we're doing in resilience. Um, the um, what we just as a case in point, we are working. We, for instance, consulted. 
uh, to one of our um, uh, one of our clients who own um, quite a lot of shopping centers uh, across South Africa, and they were looking at a main strategy for to to um, to becoming water um, resilient um, and or not maybe not but water. What's the word? I can't remember the word. You know, becoming water. Um, uh, always have enough water on their site. Sorry, I mean, I've just lost that word. Um, so they, they they can, as a shopping center, they know they're under huge pressure to provide um, a constant supply of water to the tenants and to their uh, to the customers. Um, and they were looking at a at one strategy that it was pursuing quite actively was to sink boreholes at all their sites across, um, they have sites in, um, in Gauteng and sites in the Western Cape, and then we're gonna sink boreholes to really uh, provide, uh, um, to provide the water security to the malls. Um, so bef before I go to the rest of this, of the words that, have, uh, that are on the slide, let me show you what we did with them. We looked at, uh, we used the water, the WWF water risk filter. Um, these little dots that you see on the site are the, um, are the sites um, where their uh, where their centers are located? We plotted them on this map um, in, in the water risk filter, and a, the client took very quickly took a decision just on this. Um, we, we 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 took them through quite a few um, models um, and looking at what the uh, what the future targets what what the what the future would look like for for the um, for the basins where they were sitting um, in with their malls. And they took a decision not to pursue the, um, the the borehole strategy, really on the basis of being um, good environmental stewards, um, and really uh, and they have net zero water and net zero carbon uh, targets in place already. So we're now looking with them at at, at alternatives for um, uh, you know reusing water, reducing obviously water consumption within their within their malls and. Um, and, and, and looking much more at, at water treatment um, to reducing their dependence on, um, on municipal water supply. So just to quickly go back, um, the, you know, I'm not telling anyone anything new in this, in this audience. We're talking about obviously adaptation strategies uh, for water, you know, and especially um, modeling future scenarios given climate change. And we, I think we're pretty um, well versed in this and we have all the resources um, fantastic resources for that in South Africa. Um, and then what's really important, I think that's also just, I wanted to raise this as a, um, as a point for, for the audience. Um, there, there is a new, we are busy developing a new green building rating tool for South Africa, um, which is, I guess, long overdue. It's been, um, you know, almost, you know, it's been over 10 years. Uh, probably close on 14 years now that we've had this one tool. So we're busy developing um, the Green Star new build uh, version two tool. Um, and I'm actually heading up the category on resilience. Um, and resilience is going to become, um, and we talk about climate resilience for buildings, um, operational resilience and community resilience and planning for resilience, um, you know, down, down the line. And one of the big items in, is, um, you know, one of the big resilience items is, of course, water security um, and planning for, uh, for extreme water stress while not um, uh, abstracting groundwater, but rather becoming, um, you know, look, looking for alternatives that we can do within within the watersheds where where um, where buildings are located. So I think that's sort of really the um, I just want to bring that perspective. Um, and uh, I know we always talk about you know the um, the, the sustainability of boreholes, the uh, and, and, and aquifers. So I think maybe the living building challenge um, uh, um, requirements are really interesting in this case. We I am not I'm under no. Um, uh, illusion of what the what what water scarcity and water stress means for our country for um but i thought this was quite important and thank you very much Prof, for giving me that opportunity to share this uh, where, what the kind of work that we're doing in in the in the green building space okay, i think i'm gonna i can close here thank you very much Yota, and uh, thank you for bringing that perspective to this meeting um I, I have a number of questions around this, uh, as I'm sure many have. Um, uh, so we have the discussion session, uh, so uh, we'll continue uh, discussing there. Um, uh, so thank you once again, and uh, 
uh, I'd also like to give uh, the, uh, let me get the name right, the uh, North China University of Water Resources and Electric Power, um, the opportunity to present. So um, maybe just to uh, highlight that, of course, between South Africa and China, we have um, the BRICS agreement in place. And I, I'm not sure uh, how many of, of us have, uh, have engaged with that in the context of, of water. Um, and uh, th this may be a, a chance to open that conversation. Um, and of course, um, it's a whole institution uh, largely dedicated to water and power. And uh, there's, of course, a fantastic uh, resource of expertise there. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Lynn, uh, I think you mentioned there's a video, but uh, maybe uh, if you could make that available to, uh, to this group as a YouTube link and instead uh, focus on uh, some of the expertise uh, at the institution and uh, and how you see uh, it working. Uh, we've had separate discussions on on, uh, on the possibilities of collaboration between the institutions. Um, so uh, if we could uh, maybe have a, a shorter outline of those topics. Thanks. Uh, sorry, Lynn, uh, are you there? Uh, sorry, Lynn, uh, we're not getting the audio. Um, maybe if you could stop share and then reshare uh, with uh, the audio um, enabled. So sorry, Lynn, uh, I think the audio is, is not really working out there. Um, maybe what we can do is uh, we can start the discussion and then um, uh, after the discussion session, um, we'll come back to, uh, we'll try the video again. Uh, maybe if you could look on your side, if uh, the audio uh, is, uh, is, is set up and, and all of that. Okay. So, so with that, um, let me just share this here. So I'd like to open the, uh, the floor for discussion, in particular uh, with the last discussion. Um, so between Hydro Blue and the presentation uh, by Ecocentric uh, Yota. Uh, maybe Yota, in terms of, uh, if, if I could just abuse my uh, chairing uh, here and, uh, and just ask about, you know, um, we have this classification of potable water and uh, that there has been this, um, this decision that potable water um, is, is not going to be considered for, um, for application in particular context, uh, um, as I understand it. Um, I mean, the fact that groundwater has been classified as potable water, um, you know, um, I understand legally that that 
that's the kind of uh, view of it. But um, you know, if we can talk in in terms of the um, more going back to the reason as to why uh, that would necessarily mean uh, that the source, which possibly was not thought of as as being uh, in that class of of water um, mm -hmm. originally, um, and then as part of that, of course. It, it is going to happen that groundwater is used um, in, in a water scarce country. And, you know, we will have some, um, there, there will be some uh, uh, role players in the space who will respect the rules and, and the spirit of, uh, of seeking alternative water sources. But uh, we can see that uh, the tremendous difficulty by government is uh, managing uh, the uh, you know what the various role players actually do so in in practical terms uh, looking at that there is going to be some use of of groundwater um, whether uh, there's some thinking around the technology management uh, towards that monitoring and evaluation tools as well as technology measurement tools um, that's part mm -hmm. of it and also to hear a bit about the, the role of, of uh, precipitation in this. Um, the, uh, is it necessarily that the user of potable water has to return that same mass of potable water or uh, you know, where does rainfall factor into all of this? Okay, well, thanks so much. Yeah, look, I cannot tell you exactly what the, um, the, you know, the historical development of um, classifying groundwater as potable water. But um, just from understanding what the green building rating tools in particular are trying to do is um, prevent, it, it not classify something that is not necessarily renewable as a renewable source. So like for instance, in, in, if we were to classify uh, groundwater as, um, as non-potable, um, we, you know, the the tendency would be there very clearly uh, for for buildings to abstract to, uh, to abstract water, and potentially in a in a completely unsustainable manner. You know, this this is uh, ultimately comes down to um, a re, you know a point scoring, which is what we do very well in green in green buildings, um, and uh, uh, that's you know if if groundwater was um, non potable. You know, and it would it would be very easy to get points uh, for um, for in, in 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 the water categories. I mean, I know the the groundwater would be abstracted in a completely unsustainable manner. So I think this is kind of why there there was a decision at some stage, you know, in the past, and it hasn't changed um, not for many years. Um, the definition of groundwater has been um, that it is potable water. Um, when it comes to your other question, um, the around you know, I think what you were referring to is the um, what we did, what I put on the on what I presented on for the living building challenge. Um, the um, it, looking at uh, you know really reintroducing the um, you know the abstracted water back into the same system, and I think that's really what what I find. This is something that would be really interesting to explore um, technically. I don't have that technical expertise, and I'm, I come really from the green building, from the green building consulting space. So, but it really, what, where would the possibilities really sit um, with really reintroducing um, the water that is abstracted for use in 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 a building? Um, I know from a technology from, from the technical perspective, I know we would be looking at um, at things like um, you know uh, gray, gray water preparation, um, you know, and, and black water treatment, um, and potentially then releasing this back into um, in, into the environment, um, in, back into the ground, back into the aquifers. Um, I know the technical solutions would be there, but I guess then it's probably much more for your audience, for for for, for your teams to, um, to to actually have those kinds of solutions. But I think conceptually, it's extremely, it's a very useful concept. Um, this kind of closed loop system. Um, and uh, I think one of the other questions I had there was around the uh, rainfall and how that factored into. Uh, I think it was in your presentation you mentioned about. Returning the same uh, water to the to the same site. Uh, how does uh, rainfall factor into that? Uh, should it not be uh, uh, the rainfall? Uh, uh, how can I say? 
uh, replenishment, uh, uh, that, that is possibly the margin for usage. Not really, because there's a direct and um, because a direct interference with the with with groundwater levels, um, you know, which you know, I think rainfall is more. I don't. I, I, rainfall doesn't really factor into that. No, you know, basically, the idea is what you take out, you put back, mm. um, and because that's now being used um, water that's being used on site on a particular site. Thanks for that. Yeah. And reintroducing it into the environment. Yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, I'd like to open up for uh, for the questions so that uh, I'm not uh, just dominating all the questions there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, while waiting for the hands there, um, there is also the concept of industrial symbiosis. That's where uh, the waste materials from the one industry are used as raw materials in the other. Um, so for example, if uh, the 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 water uh, that has been uh, used for sanitation uh, actually contains agricultural nutrients. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the the waste from sanitation is actually nutrient rich for agricultural purposes, for instance. Um, although I would say that's probably just reuse of water that has been removed from uh, the groundwater source that's uh, using it for agricultural purpose. Uh, doesn't really solve the problem uh, or is there other thinking around that? Are you speaking that, that directed at me? Uh, yes, please. Because, yeah, um, not, I mean, look, it, it, let's, you know, let's, let's talk about the, the Green Star lead um, and, and, um, and Edge will not allow, you know, you, of course you can abstract groundwater, but you can't count this as, um, as a sustainable water source, um, you know, and projects that want to be seen as being net zero water cannot use groundwater. Let's put it this way. That's the one thing. So there, you know, the abstraction of groundwater doesn't even, would not feature um, for in, in a living building challenge. I'm not quite sure how this would be used, you know, re reintroducing it back into agriculture provided, I guess, with, it's, it's within the same watershed or the same, you know, sitting on the same, within the same system. Um, I'm sure that, that that would be doable. Yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe Josh, uh, as the kind of um, other main role player in, in that conversation, uh, any thoughts from your side? Hi, Prof. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, Jetta as well, I think there was a great presentation. I was just wondering, um, you know, you talk about uh, the concept of what you take out, you put back in. But um, you know, with the lack of piped infrastructure in most of these remote regions, will that not happen on some level in the kind of out of metropolitan regions? Uh, absolutely, I would imagine absolutely that happens. Yes, I mean, I really look. I, I come really very much from the um, you know my, what I'm talking about is really a, it's, it's largely around commercial projects. Um, we talk about we, we look at urban areas. Um, when you look at um, you know, I, I don't have that much experience with um, with with uh, you know sustainable water supply in rural areas. Um, yes, of course, the the expectation would be that it would actually be going back into you know just because of lack of sanit of uh, of uh, sanitation infrastructure. I would imagine it actually goes back, provided it's of course it's treated. Mm. So I, I take your point about uh, this being more in application for these commercial projects, but of course, for the long-term sustainability of our water resource, um, I, I think we do have to look also uh, more broadly and uh, you know, at, at what's happening in, in general. And towards that, um, are there certain solutions that have been derived over time that could be applied um, in the more general sense? So it might be that uh, because um, in the more commercial projects that there are, uh, you know, there, there's a different scale of infrastructure that's available. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the things that we need to do and, you know, the, the economic feasibility changes as water scarcity increases, then uh, things become more economically feasible at a wider scale. 
So are there solutions that uh, should be looked at that have not been considered so far? I have not come across this. Look, the, the work that we're doing in net zero water is, it tends to be really, you know, in, in certain our urban areas, it tends to be very complex. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything that we, you know, I'm, I, and I'm also not that okay with, uh, with those kinds of technologies, which I'm hoping that maybe, especially maybe from the Water Research Commission or um, Joe Ash, you know, I think from the work that you're doing, you're probably more familiar with that. But in our buildings, mostly what we're looking at is, is quite, is um, we're looking at, um, you know, reducing water upfront, of course, that's, the, that's our first step. And then, um, you know, treating uh, gray water and black water on site, hopefully for, um, for reuse in, within buildings. Um, we did some work on, um, on, on a reverse osmosis project in the Western Cape. Um, this was really at the height of, uh, of the, um, the, you know, when we were looking almost at, at day zero. Um, where we used um, treated uh, great treated um, uh, wastewater from the, um, the which is supplied by the city of Cape Town through one of their waterworks, and then we used this we treated this to uh, primary standards in order to um, you know to actually just avoid exactly that to avoid um, having to sink boreholes um, to supply water to um, to office buildings. But um, you know those kinds of technologies we've looked at um, black and plus black water treatment, which we know is is is, is it has comes with its own complexities. Okay, uh, thanks, Yatta. Um, I'd like to uh, call on AK. Uh, so uh, uh, Abdul, um, in industry um, and in in your sector in particular. Uh, have you been looking at uh, water and uh, the the possibility of uh, of of reducing consumption and uh, returning to the network and uh, uh, because you've been looking at quite a broad range of innovations uh, maybe by way of introduction uh, uh, ak uh, abdul kamla is uh, the uh, chief innovation officer at kdg logistics thank you so much for that Andeed. uh yeah the thing is we have a uh, a site in camperdown where we are doing some quite extensive work at uh, aiming towards net zero um now i've been listening to some of what Jutta said and and it's really really exciting to see the strong move towards um, net zero in in the commercial building space but i think if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the primary consideration in, in what uh, you just described was trying to get to um, ac equitable access to water in rural areas. Um, and, and I think we face very different challenges in, in the two spaces. So um, in the urban and, and peri-urban areas um, where we have a lot of the commercial activity, um, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to say that we want to be good corporate citizens and we climate aware, we understand what is going on in terms of um, the, the, uh, the, the climate challenges from, from greenhouse gases. We try and mitigate some of the uh, causative elements, and then we look at some of the, the impact elements and we see what we can do. Now, um, it, as, as, as businesses, we hold ourselves accountable. And, and very often we use the ratings agencies to guide us in terms of what action steps um, would have maximum impact, how to measure these impacts and how to set trajectories for improvement in that space. Um, so for example, in the Camperdown site, uh, the, the first phase of the development was to just get the whole site functional and, and um, to, to be able to contain all the runoff water and, and treat uh, water appropriately. So you, you have different classifications of the water and you treat each one of them differently and you try and um, reuse as much as possible on site. And then second phase, uh, you look at trying to reuse everything on site um, and, and reduce your municipal water consumption to zero. So I think, you know, industry has to a large extent um, developed these trajectories. Um, but I think that's a concurrent activity. We're trying to ensure that people who do not have access to portable water get some access to portable water. And I think that's where the power of what you're doing arrives at. Um, if people who are trying to stretch uh, budgets to, to bring water to people in, in underserved areas, 
um, if they can manipulate the outcomes such that the, the, the budget can serve more people um, with basic water infrastructure, I think you know, that's, that's a significant uh, step forward um, for, for a country like South Africa, where you've got the, um, the rural areas, which are so very different in, in, in access to services compared to the urban areas. Great, thanks for that, AK. Um, Jonathan, your thoughts? Yeah, Prof, uh, look, uh, I think it's more prudent that solutions like this to make sure that uh, the water resources are optimally used. So um, from my side, I'm ready to listen to these kind of great ideas. And if we can partner them to make sure that they uh, become commercial activities, that's where I can fit in. You know, So we just look forward for you guys who have a passion for this kind of research, et cetera, to come up with these great ideas. So I just want to be a strong supporter of the initiative that you guys are coming up with. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. And I mean, with the recent flooding that we've had, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's an ironic situation that due to floods, uh, people are without water. And of course, um, you know, the intermediate concept there is that there should be a technology that helps you convert uh, rainwater into drinking water or flood water. You know, flood water is a different thing, but, uh, um, you know, innovations like that. Um, and there are many technologies out there for converting rainwater into drinking water. But, um, you know, uh, then this classification of potable and, you know, that's where classification also does drive policy and then influences uh, what becomes feasible. Um, I'm not quite sure who I'm addressing that to. Uh, anyone can, uh, can comment further there. Yeah, Prof, I'd like to comment again. Uh, that's one side of the coin. Um, the, the other side is a more serious one. It, 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 you guys may get the impression that I'm anti-government, but the other side is a more serious one of lack of proper infrastructure maintenance. Mm -hmm. And it goes across the board to show that if we really maintain our infrastructure, we wouldn't have been facing this kind of devastation. So the flood is the easiest scapegoat currently. It's the best narrative the politicians have, and it's the best narrative that they could ever get. But the bottom line is clearly shabby workmanship and poor uh, infrastructure management. Clearly, I, I mean, I always tell the story. I've got an, uh, a 1948 Sherv. It runs perfectly well. The only reason it runs perfectly well, it's constantly serviced and maintained. There's no other reason. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, AK? Yeah, um, yeah, Brandy, I think. You know, if we if we have to look at the the recent floods in Durban, and and we took the brunt of it out here at the at my the site I'm I'm actually speaking from is at the old airport, and I am about twenty meters away from the freeway where the containers were flowing down mm. at high speed during the flood. So, we've you know for us it was an acute wake up call, but I think we need to take many lessons from that. One is that climate change is real. Um, the the human impact on the planet has been significant and largely negative. The worst thing this planet ever did for its, uh, uh, in, its, in its entire existence is allowed the proliferation of human beings. Um, you know, I, I think we are a threat to our own species and to the other species on the planet. But notwithstanding that, I think the, the reality of, of climate change and the accelerated impact of climate change uh, struck home, certainly to the, to the KZN communities. And, um, I think we, it forces us to become more climate aware. So I think that's the one, one impact is, is climate awareness that the education systems pick up on this and create uh, debates within the, the um, schools, which, which would then influence you know, household decision-making around uh, climate awareness and, and better climate choices. So every time you order something online, is it an urgent item? Is it non-urgent? Every time you go to the supermarket, can you do one trip a week instead of one trip a day? That kind of thing. You know, we need to look at all of these things. But um, 
beyond that, I think it also is a wake up call that a lot of our wastewater infrastructure and our uh, utilities in general in this country was designed maybe 40, 50 years ago. Um, and, and I think the world it was designed for no longer exists. If you look at the fact that um, more than half the man-made CO2 in the atmosphere was created in the last 50 years, I think the, the, the next 20 years is going to be very different from the past 20 years in terms of the environmental stresses we'll be under and the stresses we would have to cope with. So I think one of the challenges that the municipalities face is rehabilitating the infrastructure that was damaged, but also to reassess um, with a forward-looking view, what, uh, what, what do we have to cope with in future and, and how to develop strategies to deal with that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th th these are, are significant engineering um, uh, and, and policy uh, decisions that have to be taken. And, and I, I'm hopeful that... Our um, sorry, Sorry, it's cutting in and out there, uh, AK, but um, I think, um, you know, one of the things we're looking for in this forum is, uh, you know, technology solutions to these problems. Now, one of the things that um, I think uh, you mentioned to me, Josh, uh, is, uh, well, it, it was something we started a while ago, looking at the data sources available on infrastructure and uh, that, that we could actually, through, uh, uh, through some particular APIs, we could actually look at the infrastructure. And Tobikile here, uh, Tobikile Gambu uh, uh, from Amgeni Water, uh, we've also been looking at some of the APIs available uh, for, um, for infrastructure. Now, what about gamifying that? Let's say um, there's uh, some technology um, service that, that we create, which exposes uh, the um, the infrastructure uh, available, its condition and uh, the, the maintenance requirements. Um, so maybe, uh, Josh, maybe you would comment first on some of that earlier work and also maybe a bit on the floodplains that uh, you mentioned uh, have, have been reported uh, many times. And then um, AK, if, if you can think about, uh, you know, the, um, our first project was about looking at gamification. So presenting data in a gamified way, and then influencing uh, the behavior. So what about something that looks at infrastructure, presents it in a certain way, and then gamifies government that there's this reporting and, and we should look at this infrastructure. Uh, Jonathan, you've got a hand up there. Yeah, Prof, uh, I think uh, the platform can be highly impactful if we have something as an early warning signal. Hmm. Um, like you've collected data on all the balls, etc. We collect data on every bridge that flooded and when it flooded. Um, every devastation along the different routes that we've recorded. And then the AI will obviously say, listen, with this amount of rainfall predicted coming, here's the early warning signal, guys. Make sure you got the, the, the causeways of water cleared, all manos cleared, etc., because something is coming. And then we, we all government accountable to say, listen, we've given you an early warning signal that this is going to happen. And you were still negligent. So, you know, I, I think that can be uh, another important push uh, whilst you are advocating for gamification. You know, an early warning signal, I think, it uh, can be a tremendous value add to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Then uh, Josh, drawing on your town planning background, um, does something like that exist? Is there a move to something like that? Is that something we could build? I'm not sure if that does exist. I do understand uh, what Jonathan is saying. We can create that. But I just have to, I'm not sure if it exists at that point. And I'm also not sure, you know, say we, if we predict that a flood is coming and you can clean the manholes, I think the biggest challenge is the settlements on hazardous zones. And I'm not sure if they actually have a strategy to move people in case of an event. So there's a few things to look at, but I think it's something I have to look into. 
So, I mean, uh, Jonathan, what you were talking about was actually a kind of recording of events and then uh, uh, maybe uh, there's a maintenance plan and, and then the maintenance plan needs to be moved up when particular stresses have uh, uh, arisen in the system. So uh, there's that. I, I think there was also a warning system in place. I think government had a, one, a warning system for flooding, which um, and uh, apparently didn't uh, pick up the, uh, so this is different. This is more like a, a um, you know, like a, a kind of weather prediction service for flooding. And apparently that didn't perform, uh, but that's quite different to what you are uh, uh, talking about in terms of, um, I think it's like a, a maintenance scheduling uh, service. And uh, when there are new stresses, then, then it would pick that up and recommend uh, that, that be advanced. Then maybe AK, in terms of the gamification and how those can be applied, uh, uh, any comments there? Yeah, I think there may be some usefulness in this. I mean, one of the, the difficulties that we had was in this particular event, the, um, the weather service, the, the early warning ability to reach the constituencies that they needed to, I think, was lacking. And then I think what was also lacking was some sort of coordination in the response uh, to the severe rainfall. Certainly at the Shangweni Dam, I think there may have been issues there um, around, you know, what, what should the control parameters be and how best to, to minimize impact uh, downstream. Um, and if you look at the, the impact areas were largely in the floodplains downstream of the Shangweni Dam. Uh, so I think if you look at the scenario as it played out and you and you identify who are the various actors that should have actually uh, played a part and, and, and what their role should have been, you can then abstract from that uh, a game which largely becomes a communication tool. So your, 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 your game commences when, when, when there's an um, adverse weather condition arising. So the weather forecast says two or three days from now you're expecting heavy rainfall and then that triggers the other actors into the game. So uh, the local disaster management areas, the, the police, um, the municipalities, the key stakeholders, the, the dam management, uh, wastewater, roads, each one of them, you know, gets an alert on a platform and each one has to acknowledge that they have uh, understood what is the threat and they have the mitigation actions in place or, or that they start their mitigation steps. So you can create some sort of virtual environment. Uh, which ties all of these actors together. And I think it's it's important to get that sort of coordination going. Um, but it would require further identifying which of these uh, uh, actors need to be part of, of the environment and then how to draw them in in a meaningful way so that the, the interrelationships between them um, become more dynamic and real time. So you have the trigger, you have the event that's impending, you have the four warning systems, you have the, the early actions, and then during the actual event, what are the steps and, and who warns who about what? And, and you can create you know, in-game in roles for each of these things, and, and, uh, but, but largely it becomes dynamic feedback loops where you've got real-time action triggering um, mitigation steps. So, so you're almost creating a defense against what, what's happening. Great, thanks for that, AK. Um, so if we can try and sum this up, I, I think um, we've come up now with a possible route, which is uh, looking at infrastructure maintenance. We know that's responsible for a great deal of water loss and other issues uh, relating to safety and so on. And there's a, and a concept towards a, a project uh, that's arising there. Um, and then I, I don't think it's actually addressing the potable water issue, Yota, but I think uh, there, uh, there's uh, uh, that. That's a space where I would say um, there is good work going on in terms of applying uh, technology that, uh, uh, or researching technology towards uh, uh, how do you return water to uh, to the source, and uh, that uh, with things uh, with the economic feasibility changing, uh, that that might expose new opportunities. Uh, you have unmuted. Uh, uh, would you like to uh, to say something there? No, thanks so much. No, I I I completely agree. I think that's the um, like everything else. Um, you know, none of this is um, you know 
let's let's put it this way let's th these are voluntary systems none of this is cast in stone and i think it's extremely important to remain agile um and adaptive as we you know now as we're being faced with a, a an environment and a climate that's changing faster than we have ever experienced um and i think remaining um you know remaining open to new solutions that uh could be tech technical purely technical solutions um will be really important and i think that's why these conversations are so important as well um, i think just to avoid groundwater just for just for the sake of avoiding it and um, when there are other solutions out there um that we can take into account uh, um that would be silly so i think those yeah thank you very much this is um i think this would be a would be great to kind of carry on these kinds of conversations and also with those um in in my industry um to to ensure that uh, we you know, we, we really keep that open mind and find new solutions for this. Great, thanks so much for that, Jutta. And uh, we have exceeded the time already by 10 minutes. Um, so I, I still want to give uh, Lynn a space to uh, present, but uh, for those who can't stay further, um, I'd like to sincerely thank you for coming and thank you so much to our speakers so far. Uh, really enjoyed the session. Um, and uh, Lynn, uh, if, if you can stay, pl uh, please do. Um, Lynn, are you able to present now? Yes. Can you hear me right now, Professor Randia? Yes, that's much better. Thanks. Okay, okay. So I will give my presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Lin. I'm responsible for the Center for Lean Cooperation in Running Schools of NCWU. I'm very glad to attend this meeting. I'm being... uh, we've lost audio there again, Lin. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the, the audio is just not working out there. Um, so uh, I would say, uh, Lynn, uh, if it's possible, uh, if you could uh, YouTube this, uh, this presentation so that uh, we could share it uh, with the, the audience from today. And then um, I think uh, it will really be uh, great. Uh, we'll have another uh, seminar session and uh, we'll have another opportunity to present. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the audio just didn't cooperate. It's a bit strange. Normally, the uh, if the video is working, the audio should work as well. But uh, um, yeah, I also don't want to uh, run too far past the time. Um, uh, might that work better, Lynn? Uh, if you if your audio is not working, maybe if you can type into the chat. Uh, anyway, I'll I'll chat with you offline, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get the video to the audience. Uh, so with that, uh, thank uh, thank you all again so much for for coming and contributing. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about, and uh, uh, in in fact, I had hoped to reserve some time for us to talk about whether to continue the conversation uh, and uh, with the next geo stage uh, discussion um, and the fact that we couldn't find a space to get to that uh, uh, makes me suspect yes we should just go ahead and schedule the next one uh, so uh, uh, look out for that email and then thank you all again so much uh, to all the speakers uh, thank you all for engaging and we'll see you in the next one then we take care. Thank you to all the speakers. Cheers. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Next.